So please welcome to the stage now James Kuno, President and CEO of the Getty Trust, and Philip Kennicott, the Pulitzer Prize winning art and architecture critic of the Washington Post. Thanks very much. I'm here with a man whose work I deeply admire, a man who's uh, taken some brave and difficult and controversial uh, stances on some of the most difficult issues that face art museums in the country today. So let's launch into the first question and the first big story that's out there, everybody's talking about it. It's the case of a trove of art that's been found in an apartment in Munich. Apparently it's been sitting there for decades, likely acquired during the Nazi era, maybe uh, under some very unfortunate conditions in which people may have been required to sell art under duress or simply had it forfeited. Um, given your position, can, do you have any knowledge, privy, to what's going on in this, in this fascinating story? Uh, no, I only know what I've read and probably what everyone has read in the, the newspaper. Uh, so it's a little confusing because we don't know very much, um, but there's some interesting questions about it, I think. Uh, one of the, as you will know, this is the son of a man who was one of the four art dealers uh, the Nazis identified as, as able to sell these so-called degenerate works of art or works of art they wanted to remove from Germany. And the, Ger the Nazis removed such art from individuals as well as from state museums. The works of art that came from state museums, Germany has never claimed back because that was an act of a government action. Uh, it's from private individuals. So it's, we don't know first among these so, so many works of art, maybe some 1,200 works of art, how many were taken from private individuals and how many from state collections. We don't even know what, uh, what, uh, what comprises these, uh, these objects because we've never seen them. You know, they've been, they've, uh, only a number of people working on the provenance within Germany has seen, and seen them. We don't know if they're authentic. We don't know if they're good condition. We know that they're said to be 200 and some odd paintings, some 700 and some odd works on paper. And someone said they were worth $1.3 billion, but no one that we know has seen them to be able to put a dollar to it. But, so it's all rather confusing at this time. The big question is, why did we learn about it this way? And why wasn't, when, because this is something that the German government uh, has been working on the provenance questions for at least a year, so far as we know. Uh, but they didn't do it um, in a transparent way, and now uh, it's gotten very confusing. It is curious. We live in an age in which we can crowdsource information very efficiently. Um, but the German government's been sitting kind of on this. They've released only 10 or I think now 20 images of paintings. Why keep that information so close to the best? Well, I don't know. The German government has been very good uh, about this matter. They've set up research centers uh, um, you know, with digitized information so that one can go and do research on, on matters. I should say in promoting the Getty, uh, that the Getty Research Institute has a provenance index, and it working with um, uh, two different libraries in uh, Germany has also uh, developed an online search database uh, of 250,000 records, and so we're in contact with them uh, uh, on this matter. But why they did it, the only answer that one can come up with is uh, that this is very deliberate, slow, painstaking work, and they thought it would be a good idea to get that done first before all they had to answer all these claims that are now going to come. Uh, it probably was a good idea in a certain way, and then it turned out to be a bad idea because it looked as if they were hiding something. And there's nothing in the way that the Germans have behaved uh, in the last 50, or last 65 years that indicates that they would ever hide something. Given that the people who may legitimately have a claim on this art, or even their descendants, are likely to be elderly people now, is the rate at which this is unfolding, is, is that a reasonable process? That's a good question. I don't know. It is a real sense of urgency because this is the, this is the generation, um, this is the last decade or two of that generation. So uh, this is the time in which to restore a relationship with, with these, these individuals and with the people they uh, are associated with. Um, but it has to be a deliberate process. It has to get to the right people and, and it's not a very easy uh, thing to resolve. And so to rush it uh, is likely to make some mistakes and then one might pay for it l later. Uh, sadly, it is a painful process, but gratefully, it's coming at this time. And uh, there is a sense of urgency, but it needs to be done very carefully. Let me move on to another question, set of questions that involve returning art or changing the ownership of art. And those are the questions that surround antiquities that may be claimed by foreign governments, uh, antiquities that are sitting in American museums, for instance, at, at the Getty. Uh, the New York Times ran a story earlier this year in which the headline read something like, um, the, the great give back. Are we at a crisis point now where we're going to see the floodgates open and a lot of material that's been held in American museums for decades um, 
being returned to countries such as Turkey and Italy and, and China and Cambodia? Yeah, this is the, this is the kind of the question about which my views are sometimes held to be controversial. I, I recognize that they're held to be controversial only by people who disagree with me. Uh, <laughs> but people who agree with me don't find them controversial at all, so I, I don't quite understand the term. But um, it, it, uh, it, there, is in, there is a steady stream of um, claims made on European and North American museums by countries um, that uh, one calls source countries, that is countries that have a long history of having antiquities uh, on their, on their, within the jurisdiction of the modern state, whether it be Turkey or Greece or Egypt or Jordan or Syria even, uh, or Italy or, or Sicily. Um, and and there's this, it tends to come up uh, you know, when, when new information is found, and that's when it should come up, because these are uh, generally good faith acquisitions or purchases by museums um, and, and who do provenance research on the objects before they buy them, because of course a risk is taken when buying something. That's a risk, a financial risk, a reputational risk, a legal risk. So you don't do this um, e easily and simply. You do it after a great deal of labor with all available known information. Um, but sometimes it, new information comes up, and that's what happened in the Getty some years ago. Uh, it was, as you'll remember, um, a, a, um, a discovery by the Italian authorities uh, when they raided a, a warehouse in Switzerland that they found all this information. And in that information was convincing information that the, some of the things that the Getty has, some of the things the Metropolitan, Boston Museum, Princeton, uh, uh, other museums in this country uh, had, uh, they were, were, were removed from Italy uh, illegally or inappropriately, and so they were returned because the, the, the evidence convinced everyone that, they, they, that these museums I just identified didn't hold clear title. So that's when you do return such things. You don't return such things because someone claims them without evidence that these, without convincing evidence. Uh, sometimes, and this I think is very tricky, and, and it interests me a great deal, um, because uh, I, I'm interested in s settling some, or a answering some questions uh, in terms of the world in which we now live, which is we live in a very globalized, multicultural, poly, um, multi-ethnic world where people are moving across borders very regularly. And it, we are spreading throughout the world from every, every corner of the world immaterial culture, whether it's uh, movies or music or literature or whatever it might be. It's when it's material culture, when it's things that one can see and hold in one's hand that are unique in and of themselves, that there seems to be a problem about their mobility. When many of these things were made um, as mobile objects. They were made for the trade, uh, and they were carried by tradesmen, and, and they were made by artists who came across similarly uh, uh, other strange and wonderful things, and they were inspired to make new things because of that. And I think it's extremely important for us, and then I should stop, I guess I get, you know, get wound up on this, but I think it's extremely important for us living in the world in which we live, in which we're gonna be finding ourselves in this country or in, uh, in Southeast Asia, East Asia, South Asia, we're gonna be finding ourselves living next to people who are strange to us, who don't share the same immediate history that we, share, we, we have, we, we share. And, 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 and getting to know the cultures with which they historically identify is a way of getting to know them. So it's important for us, and it's in the, in the, in the interest, I think, of the world, that we share cultures. Now, that could be either by loan or by purchase, but it's about access, access to strangeness and wonderful things, the history of which we have a, a common stake, in which we have a common stake. Um, however, and I'll stop, however, governments in some cases want to retain within their jurisdiction these things because of a national ideology associated with them and claims made on these objects that they share a soul with the people of, of the region. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the question of whether an object, a work of art, a m sculpture, mar marble sculpture, bronze sculpture, has a soul is a question less better answered by philosophers than by politicians. Um, but it gets to that level of, of, of passion, and it's usually by the government in power speaking on behalf of all of the citizens or all of the uh, subjects of, of that authority, even when they discriminate against classes of those subjects or those citizens, whether it's the Kurds in Turkey or whether it's the mixtures of populations in India or whether it's the Uyghurs in China. Uh, you know, it's national identity and, and ethnic uh, e ethnicities don't map neatly in the modern nation state era. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment in the role of somebody who might be thinking of your views as controversial. Um, 
The argument is about the illegal trade in antiquities, the looting of archaeological sites, and things that museums can or can't do to try and curb that trade. The argument is that if you've got and are displaying and holding objects that are not clearly provenanced um, from before certain international covenants were signed in the 70s, or in the case of the Turks even earlier, um, that you're aiding and abetting that trade. You're setting a bad example, but even more than that, you're actually encouraging people to go and loot archeological sites to, to find this material and get it into the trade. What's your, what's your feeling about the museum's role in relationship to that problem? Yeah, usually the claims for repatriation on objects that have been in museums collections for a very long time, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the relationship between the acquisition of that object and any recent looting is very distant. So it doesn't seem to me the repa on the re repatriation claim that one would do that on that basis. However, the acquisition of recently discovered works of art um, is very complicated by that fact because one wants to be certain, first of all, that something has been removed legally. If one um, can't determine that that was some evidentiary, on some evidentiary basis. One wants to know that it's been out for a very long time so that it doesn't incentivize someone to loot and then to sell, and you would, don't want to be in a chain that close to, to, to looting. What I would say is, um, you know, looting is a very complicated thing, and not acquiring a antiquities is not going to prevent looting. Looters don't wake up one day and decide between being a lawyer and a looter. Uh, these are people with very few choices. These are people in failed states with failed economies who are desperate. They're willing to risk their lives because in some cases they could lose their lives if they're found guilty of looting. So to, to, to prevent looting is going to, to uh, require a much larger um, uh, a set of activities that's going to have to restore a stable government, a stable economy, stop warfare, stop sectarian violence, stop looting, uh, stop acquiring and incentivizing looters. And, and I can tell you that no reputable museum in North America or Europe is acquiring things that haven't been outside of the country prior to 1970 without clear provenance because we have made a decision not to do so. So if looting is going on on the scale that is said that it is going on, it's going on, it, it, other people are buying it. And where they're buying it, where it's going, I don't know. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, 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 it's, a des it's a very serious problem. Once something's been taken from the ground, it's not going back in the ground, the archaeological record has been destroyed, we've lost knowledge. Let me, let me bring us to Washington for a moment. Um, the Smithsonian is looking for a new secretary. Um, this is one of the most powerful and influential positions in the museum world, in this country, even internationally. Uh, a lot of conversation about what the skill set for that job should be, the balance between fundraising, um, maybe even the balance between whether, uh, whether this person comes from the sciences or the humanities. What would your ideal Smithsonian secretary look like at this point? And you can name names and you can <laughs> throw your hat in the ring right. if you want to. Um, I think uh, it, it's a, it, like any institution of, of great consequence of which the Smithsonian is, uh, the leader would need to have, one would need to consider three areas of, 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 of qualities of the leader. One is quality itself, that is what is character of this person? Does this person have integrity, good judgment, and then does this person have the energy, the compatibility, the decisiveness, you know, all those qualities one wants to have. And then experience, what kind of experience does this person have that's going to lend him or her likely to, likely, the likelihood of success in, in, uh, in leading an uh, um, institution of that complexity? And that person is likely going to be someone who comes from a university or has had long-standing uh, experience in a university because a university president or provost or anyone who's familiar with being an administrator in a, in a high position within a university knows that it is every tub in its own bottom, uh, everybody's fighting over everything, uh, and the president or the director has very little direct influence. All, the director has to articulate a vision, persuade people to follow him or her, uh, has to be able to make tough budgetary decisions and personnel decisions, but it's going to have to be able to lead by example and by, by persuading. Has, someone has got to be able to articulate something, and that comes to the vision, the third category of the person. What kind of vision do they have to, to, for that people are going to want to, to follow to, uh, and to be a part of? What, what story are they going to be able to tell that's going to convince in this case of the Smithsonian, a lot of people who are going to, that, that, that that'll be needed to give money to the Smithsonian. So if the person's gonna have to have a, have a story, a story about curiosity about the world, and that's true whether it's the science or the arts or the history, because the museums, in that sense, are quite similar. They, you know, they're all about research, education, access. And access in this day and age is by digital means uh, a lot, increasingly. So this person's gonna have to be knowledgeable of or encouraging of 
uh, the digital, digital as assets, a access, as well as digitized uh, resources for research and education that comes uh, associated with it. So it's a complicated job, um, but uh, you know, the, the Wayne Clough, who's the current secretary, has done a terrific job. So I'm sure that there are people out there who will be able to, to follow in his, uh, his good footsteps. Let me ask you about your career. Uh, you were at the Art Institute of Chicago. You also were at the Art Museums in Harvard. Now you're on the, uh, the left coast. Um, incidentally, there's a wonderful show that's from the Getty at the National Muse uh, Building yeah. Museum right now. I, I urge everybody to go see it. But is culture different out there? Um, uh, it's culture different out there. Uh, it, well, that's a, gosh, that's a tough question. I think basically it's not different. Uh, however, it's accessed differently, which is to say, um, uh, you know, Los Angeles isn't a, 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 a 19th century city. It's a 20th century, it's a mid 20th century city. It's a city that's sort of strung out along Wilshire Boulevard. It's not a city that is, that is uh, you know, in concentric circles like Chicago is from, from, from the park and from the Art Institute of Chicago, you know, where you can just rings of, 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 of uh, avenues accessing it. So people don't come, have a real clear identification with a single institution. People have identifications with multiple institutions. Uh, they don't have the benefit that they're being multi-generational identifications with it. Um, so it's a, it's, this is gonna sound terrible, I don't mean it to sound this way, but it, maybe it's a bit more retail in Los Angeles, but I don't mean exchange of money. I just think it's much more about visits. It's not about integrating that cultural institution yet into one's own narrative, one's own life, and one's family life. And I think you can get a sense of that actually by the exhibition I mentioned, yeah, where there's a lot absolutely. of wonderful retail architecture on display. Um, thank you, Jim Kuno. It's been my pleasure to chat thank with you, you today. Thank you very much.